All right, guys, we are back. And in this module, we're talking about marketing your deals, right? Marketing the properties that we have under contract. So first and foremost, before I jump into some of these different strategies that we use, I want to just make a quick disclaimer in that we are not marketing the property that we have under contract for sale. We are marketing the contract to purchase the property. So we're not necessarily marketing the property, we're marketing our contract to purchase. We are marketing our equitable interest that we have gained by getting the property under contract. So we can do this very simply by making posts online. We can text our buyers, email our buyers if we already have a list of these individuals. We can go about using different softwares to pull lists of recent cash transactions. But regardless, if we're going to make posts online via Craigslist or local Facebook groups or even the Facebook marketplace, we want to make sure that we are keeping in mind that we are marketing the contract to purchase the property. So what I typically do is I'll throw pictures of the property up in my marketing. Let's say I'm going to make a Facebook post in a local group or even on the marketplace, right? I'm going to put pictures of that property up that I'm going to have gotten during my inspection period or during my appointment with the seller. All right. I'm going to make a little blurb about the property. Hey, this is, you know, this address with two beds and one bath and it's 800 square foot and it was built in this time frame. Right. And I'm going to make a little selling features and just put a little bit of information in there. That's going to make this property look enticing. It's going to make it look like a good deal for somebody. But at the end of that, I'm going to make a note. I'm going to put an asterisk and I'm going to put owner by contract, or I'm going to put, I am selling my contract to purchase this property. We need to make sure that we are disclosing that we are not selling a property in the event that we have not bought the property yet. This is very, very important. And you can get in trouble by marketing a property that you haven't purchased is, you know, if you are not disclosing that you are the owner by contract. So simply put in your marketing to find a, 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 a partner or a cash buyer, you need to make you need to make sure that you are writing in there that you are selling or marketing your contract to purchase the properties. Very, very, very important. Okay, so now that we've gotten that out of the way, we are going to make sure that we get good photos of the property. The more photos, the better. You know, I sometimes see people marketing a property with four or five photos and, you know, that doesn't give me much interest. You know, I typically go out and I take anywhere from 30 to 50 pictures of a property when I'm out there. I get a bunch of pictures of the outside. I get a bunch, bunch of pictures of the inside. I make sure that I get multiple pictures in, in multiple corners of the room. So let's say you maybe have a room that's misshaped or maybe you have a room that's shared. Maybe it's a family room, dining room combined into one room. It's a large room, right? Well, I want to make sure I get back and I take a picture from the corner of each of the, of, of, of the corners of the room so I can get every angle in there. I want to make sure I get pictures of the flooring. I want to make sure I get pictures of the ceilings and the light fixtures in the bathroom. I'm going to take multiple pictures this way and that way if I'm using a cell phone. All right. Same thing with the kitchen. The more photos, typically the better. And occasionally I'll even do a video walkthrough with my phone or a local little tiny camera that I sometimes carry of the property. And I can add that into YouTube or Vimeo, and then I can share the link in my marketing. So if somebody's really interested, they can not only see photos of the property, but they can also see a video walkthrough of the property. Now the video walkthrough can be very, very helpful if the photos that you take aren't in sequence. So this is another pro tip. If you're going to take photos of a property, don't just randomly get a photo here and randomly get a photo in the basement and randomly get a photo. Make your photos in sequence. So the way I typically do it is I'll walk up, I'll find the curb in the front of the house and I'll snap a picture of it. Then I'll walk around the house and every time I go 20 or 30 feet, I'll get another picture. That way when people are swiping through my photos or clicking through my photos, they can see exterior first. Start in the front, then go to the corner, then go to the side, then go to the back, then maybe some other corner, the other side, and then all the way back to the front. Then as I'm walking in the front door, I'm going to get a picture. And every time I walk into a new room, I'm going to get a picture. Because by having a sequence, 
for your photos. It's gonna make it much, much easier for them to get a general understanding of the layout and the floor plan of the home versus it being totally random. One in a kitchen, one in a bathroom, one in a basement, one in an attic. They're gonna have no idea what the floor plan is. So the walkthrough video is gonna be very, very helpful, but if you don't have time or don't do the walkthrough video, don't worry, not the end of the world. Just try to keep your photos in some sort of sequence so somebody that's looking at these photos can determine if it, you know, if this is going to be something that they're going to want to come out and take a look at and learn more about. Okay. All right. Next, once you get our photos, we're going to use the general information that I kind of mentioned earlier. I'm typically going to put the address in my marketing. I'm typically going to put the number of beds, the number of baths, and the square footage. I may even add in when the home was built. And then finally, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do one, maybe two or three sentences, but nothing crazy about the selling features of the home. So I may say, hey, this is a beautiful two-story home. You know, it doesn't need a ton of work. It features a walkout basement and a fenced-in backyard. Or maybe I say it has a finished basement and a two-car attached garage. Whatever your property is or has that is going to be appealing to an end buyer or an investor, put that in your selling description. Keep it simple. Don't overthink it. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically say, hey, I think the ARV or the after repair value of this particular property is, and I'm going to put it in there. Let's assume it's 150000 The ARV is 150000 Next, I'm going to put the repairs that I think they are. And the better you become at this and the more you do this business, the better you're going to get at determining these repairs. So, you know, personally, I love putting the ARV the repairs, and then below that, I put my asking price. Now, all investors and cash buyers and anyone that's going to be buying a property, they need to do their own due diligence. But if you can help them see that your particular deal is in fact a deal, it's going to make it look more appealing, okay? So I'm typically going to put my ARV, let's say it's 150. Let's say the repairs to get to the 150 are 20,000. I'm going to say, hey, 20,000 for repairs. And you can even use spreads. You could even say 20 to 25,000 for repairs if you wanted to do that. And then last but not least, I'm going to put the asking price. So in this scenario, let's say I got this property under contract at 90. It has $150,000 ARV with $20,000 in repairs. I'm going to market this property probably around 110,000, which leaves me a 20 thousand dollar wholesale fee assuming I get a full asking price offer at a hundred and ten thousand so I'm gonna put asking a hundred and ten thousand or best offer you know and then the very last thing I'm gonna typically do is one or two more things is I'm gonna put if the property is vacant or not if it is not vacant and is occupied by a homeowner or tenants I'm gonna put in big bold letters all caps Please do not disturb the occupants or the tenants or the owner. This home is occupied, all right? If it is not occupied, I'm going to put, you know, home is not occupied, it's vacant, and call to inquire about a time to show it. So depending on the scenario, that's going to be the next thing you're going to want to put. And down below, I'll make notes on this also. There'll be bullet points, make it really, really simple for you folks here. But the very last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put my call to action. And that's going to be contact Dave at this phone number or send an email to this person at this email address, right? Or maybe I'm going to be hosting an investor open house this Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. I'm going to put that in the bottom, but you need to have a call to action. And in fact, sometimes I see people marketing deals and they don't have a call to action. If it's on Facebook, you can DM them. It makes it a little bit easier. But if it's on Craigslist or somewhere else and they don't have a phone number or an email address to reach out to to get more information, to get a lockbox code, or to set up an appointment to go view the property, all of that effort was wasted. So, you know, arguably the most important thing we can do when we are marketing the property or another way to word that, guys and girls, is the contract to purchase the property. That's really the right way of doing this. 
We need to make sure we have a call to action to let people know that they can call us or email us or direct message us or DM us or text us or whatever it may be to get more information, to get the lockbox code and or to set up on a time, uh, set up an appointment or a time to meet with us so they can get in. It's very, very rare that a buyer is going to buy a property site unseen. In fact, I've only done that once or twice in my entire life and it didn't end up being that great of a deal. So I'd always encourage you to try to meet your buyers, right? Your local investors at the property. So that's what the post is gonna look like. That post could be anywhere online, any classified, could be Craigslist, could be eBay classifieds, could be Facebook Marketplace, could be a local Facebook group. Hell, you could even post this directly on your Facebook or Instagram or Twitter page to just reach an audience of investors or friends or acquaintances and you got to market it. This is a marketing business. You're going to market to find sellers that are motivated. You're going to market um, to find individuals that are looking for your convenience in exchange for a discount. You're going to use contracts to go get the property under contract and gain control and gain that equitable interest that we talked about in the last module. And then you're going to go right back to the marketing game and you're going to market the contract to purchase that property to all of your local investors. Okay, so we talked about what's going to be in the actual post that you're going to make. And I'll drop some examples down below as well. But next, I want to talk about some ways that we can reach a wider audience. So if you are, you know, already in the game and you've already done some deals, you may know some buyers. Create a list. It's called a buyer's list. And that list can contain phone numbers and email addresses along with the name of the buyer and maybe even a little bit of criteria about what they're looking for. This list can be very, very valuable because in the beginning, you might not have a list. That's okay. No big deal. But as you build a list and that list gets bigger, it's going to be more valuable because that means that when you get a property under contract, you're already going to have interested landlords and fix and flippers and investors, cash buyers, that are going to have interest. And you can easily bulk email and bulk text or even call these individuals and let them know that you have a deal that you're looking to sell and to see if they have interest. So on my buyers list, I maybe have three or 4,000 email addresses and somewhere around 800 to 1,000 phone numbers that my team can easily send a bulk text message out to these individuals or a bulk email out. And it reduces a lot of the workload and the effort of having to market the property. I can easily draft up a quick email and send it to 3,500 people with one or two clicks. So having a buyer's list can be very valuable. But again, don't worry if you don't have a buyer's list. You can build one in real time at any given time or utilize social media to reach a lot of these individuals. In fact, most of the buyers that are on my buyer's list are also in a lot of the local St. Louis, this is where I live and invest, Facebook groups that are that are specific to investing and wholesaling and fix and flipping and burying and, and being a landlord. You know, most of these investors are in these groups as well. So don't fret if you don't already have a list. But it would be a good idea to start working in and focusing on building one because it's going to make the marketing efforts of your contract to purchase your deal much, much, much easier down the road. Okay? So what would be some tools that we could use to find, um, you know, recent cash transactions or, you know, cash buyers if we are brand new at this. Well, again, utilize Facebook, Facebook Marketplace, Facebook local groups. I also love using softwares like Batch Leads and PropStream because you can pull buyers from these softwares. And in fact, down below this video, we'll put a link so you guys can check out a free trial of both of those softwares. And they both have a tremendous amount of value for not only pulling cash buyers, but also pulling lists of leads, you know, for motivated sellers like absentee owners and vacant owners and so on and so forth. So utilize these softwares to find local cash buyers that have completed cash transactions recently. Now, if you're an agent or a broker and you have access to your local MLS, you might even be able to go into your local MLS and pull a list of recent transactions and actually find the business owner's name or the name of the business that purchased. And then you can go online and find who these people are and you can call them, text them, email them your deal. There's even been scenarios in the past where I've sold deals by sending direct mail to cash buyers in the area 
or one of my actual favorite ways is using bandit signs to sell deals. You can write, hey, got a three bedroom, two bath house, must sell fast. Call today and put your phone number and place that bandit sign in the front yard or on the corner, you know, in the vicinity, on street corners, you know, within a few blocks of the home. And as investors are out looking at their properties or out driving for dollars or looking for deals, they may see one of these bandit signs and they will call you. I've sold tons of deals using bandit signs. Bandit signs can be used to find motivated sellers, but they can also be used to find motivated buyers, cash buyers, to sell your deals to. So there's a lot of different ways that we can use to market our property. But keep in mind, we are marketing our contract to purchase the property, not the property itself. We don't own the property. So we need to make sure that we are writing in the description somewhere that we are owner by contract and we are looking to sell our contract. It can either be done via an assignment or a double close. And we're actually gonna get to that in some of the future modules. This module here is all about marketing properties and marketing your contract, your inventory, which we've mentioned multiple times in this free course, all right? The next one we're gonna talk, the next module is all gonna be all about closing the deal. And we're gonna talk about the different strategies that we can use to close the deal. All right. Again, I mentioned, assi I mentioned assigning and double closing, and there's a couple other strategies that we can use too. So we're going to jump into those in the next module. But in this module, just keep in mind two things before we wrap up. Number one, you're marketing your contract to purchase. You're marketing your equitable interest in the deal. You're not actually marketing 123 Main Street because you don't own it yet. You have it under contract, which again, gives you control, but you need to disclose that you are owner by contract so you don't get into trouble. And number two, this is a marketing business, folks. You're marketing to find the deal. You're marketing to sell the deal. So if your property hasn't sold from your marketing efforts, there's really only two reasons. Number one, not enough people saw the deal. So call and text and email and post the deal more so more people can see it. The only other reason a deal doesn't sell, if a lot of people have saw it, is because it's not a deal. Your price isn't great enough or the spread that you're putting between great and good is too big, making the sale price for the end buyer not really a good deal. So if it's not price, it's eyeballs. And if it's not eyeballs, it's price. And that's really the only two reasons that a deal won't sell. So guys, check out the next module all about closing the deal and putting it all together and the different strategies we can use to actually close this up and get paid. Thanks for watching. See you in the next module.